Okay, so we continue with Okay, Sam and George. Okay. Okay, let's then Sam had it, let him go first. Yeah. Uh, it means saintly disciples, but this what would be the literal meaning? It it doesn't actually mean sa- saintly disciples. <laughs> the the original literal meaning is simply group or community. And in Pali there's the expressions, let's see. We even have Mika Sangha, that means a group of deer. Let's see. There was another use of Sangha. Yeah, anyway, it, the original meaning is group, but then in, within the, you know, the specifically Buddhist context, it refers either to what's called the Arya Sangha. That would be the group or community of noble disciples and it, in that case it refers specifically to those who are on the four paths or who have realized the four fruits and then it's used with reference to the monastic order bhikkhu sangha bhikkhuni sangha which is the order of monks and nuns I mean, now I know groups of lay people use it when they get together and practice together. They use it with reference to themselves. I mean, I don't have objection to that, but it's, it's not canonical usage. Yeah. 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 Okay, the second question is easier to answer than the first as to how one knows. There is supposed to be what they call a reviewing knowledge, a retrospective knowledge, whereby one can sort of reflect back on one's mind and then one sees what one has realized, what one has, what defilements one has eliminated, what defilements still remain. So in the case of the Arhat, there will be no defilements remaining. The problem is that a person on their own can be mis- can overestimate themselves about their achievement. So sometimes people who are meditating very uh, earnestly, very vigorously, will have some kind of like powerful experiences, and then they think, ah, that means that I'm enlightened. And so they might even come to the conclusion, and even maybe report to others that I've reached, you know, the final either some stage of enlightenment or even the final goal. But one could be, you know, deluded about that. So that's why, I mean, when the Buddha was alive, monks would report to the Buddha and then the Buddha would be able to look into their mind and determine whether they were reporting accurately or were overestimating themselves. Nowadays, it's very hard to avoid, you know, t- to find a person like that who can directly confirm one's attainment. So maybe at least good advice would be for somebody, well, my opinion is first not to be worried, concerned about rating oneself what one has attained, but just to continually look at one's mind and see whether there's still greed, hatred, and delusion in the mind. And be, you know, to be honest with oneself and to evaluate oneself accurately and to be humble that, you know, not to be out to set oneself up on a pedestal so that everybody, other people will admire one and revere one for one's self-assigned attainment. 
And then as long as one still recognizes that there's greed, hatred, and delusion, then one knows that there's still work to be done. Okay, that's the first question. Second question, relics. Okay, it's said that when saintly people are cremated, what the disciples do after the cremation is they take the remains and they pound them and then if somebody has truly reached the saintly attainment, the high attainment, they find little particles that remain. Sometimes they look like jewels, like pearls. Sometimes they're different shapes, different colors, but it's regarded as a kind of testimony to the spiritual attainment of that person. And so then they are taken and enshrined in relic chambers and Sometimes they will construct what they call a stupa. You know, that's a memorial, a memorial shrine for them, or else they'll enshrine them on altars. And I've seen some really spectacular relics. There was a group that was doing a relic tour around the United States. And there's supposed to be like a one mirac miraculous quality about the relics. This applies particularly to what is supposed to be Buddha relics, and that when they are really deeply venerated and treated with respect, they multiply. <laughs> yeah. So I've heard, I've, I haven't seen this myself, that somebody will have, say, one relic in a little reliquary, which they'll venerate and make offerings to it, then maybe after some years they'll open it up and there are two or three relics there, two or three pieces. And I saw on this relic tour that was uh, a relic tour that took place around the United States. I think this could have been 2004, 2005. I think it was under the auspices of Lama Zopa, Tibetan Rinpoche. But they had relics which they said were relics from Venerable Ananda, Sariputta, Milarepa, and from other eminent yogis and lamas and monks of the past. And they said that there was this, there was, I had seen a photograph of one of the main relic chambers, and there was just like a whole bunch of little relics, very small, looking like pebbles. But then on the tour, that same relic cha chamber had a big white relic about this size on top of all of the small relics. And the people who were in charge of the tour said that that relic was not there originally. It just appeared. One day they came to look and there it was. I think it was the relics that were supposedly belonged to Venerable Ananda. But I'm not sure that, you know, the ability to leave behind relics is necessarily proof of the actual attainment of enlightenment. It could be the product of the deep degree of samadhi. This I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I guess a question for clarity. Um, I imagine that when one becomes an arhat, that they will just have an, a heightened state of compassion, yeah. for humanity for suffering, yeah. and that they, they would play a role approximating that, meaning more interaction with others, yeah. trying to be helpful. Yeah. And the path of uh, Bukala just appears. The path of. Bukala, his practice. Upala. Oh, Bakula, Bakula. Bakula, yes. Um, you know, more, I guess he's a great teaching on renunciation. Yeah, yeah. But I don't see the connection so much to the compassion. Well, that, I think that was the point that I was trying to bring out, and also that uh, 
Bhikkhu and Alayo brought out that there seemed to be a sort of drift in, at least in from one, maybe within one community within the Sangha, towards a kind of ideal, idealization of those who have the austere ascetic qualities at the expense of the qualities of compassion. In fact, my own sort of personal theory is that Particularly if we read some parts of the Sangyutta Nikaya, one sees that there is, in the Vinaya, a bit of a tense relationship between Venerable Ananda and Mahakasapa. And Mahakasapa is the one who represents that austere, <sighs> ascetic temperament, self-denying, aloof, secluded, withdrawn, uh, one who undertakes the ascetic practices of, like his practices were never to accept offerings to meals, to use only the three basic robes, not to have extra robes, to use the robes collected from the charnel ground, and he lived in seclusion most of the time on the Vulture's Peak Mountain. Or actually, not Vulture's Peak, it's Chicken's Foot Kukurapada, Kukutapada, Chicken's Foot Mountain. Okay, and then on the other side was Venerable Ananda, who devoted himself for 25 years, always to looking after the Buddha. He was like the Buddha's personal secretary, the intermediary when other people wanted to meet the Buddha. They would always have to come through Ananda. And he was always liked very much by the bhikkhunis. Well, because he was the one who sort of interceded on their behalf to get the ordination for them from the Buddha and very popular at the palace. The women of the palace would invite Ananda to come to give discourses to them. So one could say that these represent almost like two different temperaments. And I would say that the two, these are kind of two tendencies in early Buddhism, and maybe the tendency represented by Mahakasapa reaches its culmination in a figure like Bakula, you know, even Mahakasapa would come and give teachings and admonitions to the monks, and he would praise certain practices to the monks. But Bakula, according to this sutta, remains completely aloof. And then maybe Ananda is the kind of forerunner of the bodhisattva te temperament, the one who's always maybe Ananda and Sariputta though Sariputta passed away before the Buddha, so his influence couldn't you know, directly continue after that. But they were the ones who always looked after the other monks, always devoted very much to the welfare of others. So that's my sort of take on this relationship. Okay, Stephen and Allison. Uh, Bhante, I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, I wonder if I'm off to mark to think that perhaps this sutta is a, a somewhat of a public relations campaign hmm. for the Arahant path against what might have been growing as popularity as the Bodhisattva path. Mm -hmm. Because those inserted refrains seem to be applauding, as you said, yeah. these austerities. Yeah. And it seems like without those refrains, one might read this sutta in the opposite way. Mm. Mm. And so they, they, I can imagine maybe these compilers saying, yes, that's <laughs> right. See how austere he is? See how sort of wrapped up in himself he is? That's the way to go. <laughs> so, uh, and it ties into my second question, which maybe is a bigger one. Yeah, that's not so much a question, but an observation. Well, it's I just wanted to say if, if you might agree or disagree. Yeah. Anyway, go on to the yeah, second. The second question is about the accuracy of these suttas because Owe just pointed out to me that in the Agama, Bakala has a robe. 
has so a, a robe. Oh, there's nothing here which said that he doesn't have a robe. Okay. Because as a monk, he has to have a robe. Oh, right. Okay. It's just that there was a problem. How did, how did, I can't figure out how did he get his robe if he's not accepting robes offered by householders, he's not cutting and sewing himself. The only thing, but then he doesn't want to bother others. I can't see him then saying to other monks, you make the robe for me. Right. Okay. It seems like there are sometimes differences between the Agama Chinese oh. version and the Pali version. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, if I imagine if I grew up in China and I were encountered the Agama version, and that is how I thought the suttas are, were, yeah. and maybe the the Pali would seem sort of like an altered version. So, mm. how do I know? I mean, is there a ground level of, of, of this is more the Buddha's teaching? Because there seems to be significant discrepancies sometimes. I would say, first, on the fundamental teachings, they're pretty much in agreement. It's just that the way particular suttas are formulated differ. And we have to recognize first that the teachings were preserved orally, you know, for s perhaps three or four centuries, and they were transmitted orally. And now the early Sangha would have split up into different geographical regions. This is even before the rise of Mahayana Buddhism. And then from these different geographical splits, then there would come different interpretations and technical points which would have led to the specific doctrinal tenets of the particular early schools which then became crystallized in their Abhidharma systems. But they both preserve what was essentially the same collection of suttas but probably in the course of oral transmission passages from one sutta would have been in one line of transmission might have been transposed into another sutta. And so in this way we get differences in the way the suttas have come down, which I would ascribe mainly to differences just in the decisions of the monks who are responsible for the course of oral transmission. And what we find very, very rarely do we find particular tenets of the distinct schools coming back into the suttas and showing a bias towards the position of, those, of that school. For example, in the Pali suttas, well, let's say in the Pali commentarial tradition, the idea that there is an intermediate period between one life and another is rejected. Rebirth in the Abhidhamma system is supposed to be instantaneous. But there are some passages in the Pali version of the suttas, which suggests that there is, in fact, an intermediate stage between lives. So the preservers of the Pali suttas didn't try to alter the suttas in order to make them fit into the Theravada doctrinal system. Instead, the commentaries try to explain these passages away to make them accord with the Theravada doctrinal system. And so this has become like a big field for now. It's sort of like a field which has just been opening up in the last 20, 30 years since the, the importance of the Chinese transmission of the suttas, which were not composed in China. They were actually translated into Chinese from Indian lines of transmission. And so now the comparative studies between Pali versions, Chinese versions, versions preserved in Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, even versions preserved in Central Asia and some of the languages of Central Asia. So that's become a, a big field. And like this book is especially, you know, quite important. These are a collection of papers by Venerable Analio called Madhyama, uh, Madhyama Agama Studies. So he does comparative studies between suttas, especially in the Chinese Madhyama Agama 
and their counterparts in the Pali Majjhima I didn't get to your first point. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought maybe you... I, I think it's an interesting speculation, but I would say probably if this was the time of assuming that the sutta was included in the Majjhima Nikaya at the second Buddhist council, I doubt at that point that the Bodhisattva ideal had, already had been explicitly formulated and given a kind of doctrinal support, but maybe it was a tendency, a kind of nascent tendency that was emerging. And your speculation might be, it's quite interesting, an attempt to sort of uphold against maybe like some of the monks who were sort of moving in the direction of the Bodhisattva ideal, were going out and accepting meals offered by householders and accepting robes from householders and going to an invitation, going to give public discourses, and well, giving the instructions to the nuns, very busy teaching the younger monks, having, you know, Saturday course on the Majjhima Nikaya, giving some Pali classes during the week. <laughs> and then some of the other monks, in fact, I, I new monks like that in Sri Lanka would say, how's your own practice coming? <laughs> well, Bhante, you know, I've been very busy these days. <laughs> busy with what? <laughs> well, um, yeah, look for your own good. <laughs> Dwell alone like the rhinoceros. Yes, Pante. <laughs> and so then they could have, you know, those monks who were supporting the ascetic ideal, maybe were the ones responsible for pushing to get this sutta into the Majjhima But it's closed, it's closed. No, we want this in. <laughs> I have to wonder whether even if Bakula's austerity practices have been almost exaggerated for dramatic effect, also a good, a good hypothesis. Hey, you should become a Buddha scholar. You could l leave your music alone. <laughs> Other people can play the bass, but <laughs> we need more Buddha scholars. Allison. Alison, please. Actually, my question is a similar to Steve. I have a question. Based on, what, based on what you're describing, I feel like Ananda is more like uh, today's politician who, quote, quote has charisma. This is more like today's... Today's politicians with charisma. Politician? Politicians. You said politician. I felt that way because... You mean like a, governors uh, and senators? You know, it's, it's Ananda is liked. Ananda, is, uh, um, it looked like it's dichotomous category. It, it's like it's black and white. So that's why I want to ask: Is co compassion? Yeah. Compassion is it related to human interaction, related to social skills. You know, I'm having difficulty. Maybe if you come up a bit, because oh. your voice is light and okay. it's that. Device my, is not picking my up. My question is, yeah. based on what you described, I felt uh, Ananda is being liked, like today's uh, popular boy, popular monk, and it's almost like uh, the definition of today's like politici politicians or somebody who has charisma. Charisma is a lot of describing is being liked, uh, being has yeah. has a power, has attractions, yeah. all this stuff. So that's why I want to ask, um, I'm just using a modern language. Yeah. Is it, is it look like it's, we kind of categorize into dichotomous group, like yeah. enlightenment and bodhisattva path, you yeah. got in a, in, in a very opposite yeah. direct, opposite yeah. path. And I, I want to know that is, is anybody study that compassion is, has correlation with 
social skills or popularity. That whether compassion action, has yeah. correlation with social skills and popularity? Well, I would say that somebody who has strong compassion would make more of an effort to cultivate social skills. And through having social skills, that would lead to popularity. Um, like there are four qualities mentioned in the suttas, a uh, set, which in a sense represents compassion and action. These are called the four sangahavatu, which are sangaha. It's not, not sangha, but sangaha means binding together, collecting, bringing together. So these are four qualities which sort of attract or bring people together with oneself. I think in Chinese it's shi fa. Si shi fa. Shi. Fourth tone, right? Shi fa. Shi. With an E. Shi fa. What, am I, what tone am I saying? Yeah, se, shi, fa. Okay, it's the four sangha vattu. So this is giving, dana, pleasant speech, uh, endearing speech, um, beneficial conduct that's acting that benefits others. And then the fourth one, a little ambiguous, but it could be taken to mean Equality, treating others like one treats would treat oneself. Okay, and so I wouldn't compare Venerable Ananda. To, when I hear politician, I think of somebody who is going out of his way to try to be popular in order to get elected so he can have position and power. Whereas Ananda is not like that at all. But it seems that he was very popular, he had a very loving, lovable personality, and so he would naturally attract people. And so it's said in the text, in, in it's also said in the Parinibbana Sutta, that whenever the bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen and lay women come to meet Ananda, they always feel joyful and happy. And whenever they have to leave him, then they always feel a little bit disappointed that they have to go and leave him. <laughs> okay, l one, two, and then we have to stop. Johnny and Ed. Pandey, pa the question actually is from the internet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, sh sh I think it's sh she asked, but isn't that very same issue that prevent Venerable Ananda from attaining arhanship while both Venerable Kasapa attain highest food. Okay. The, 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 that issue means what you said before, being, being loving kindness, yeah. not, not <laughs> being politician, because the question asked before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that might be the case. Though, you know, the Buddha accepted Venerable Ananda to become his personal attendant, and he rejected all the other monks who volunteered for the position because he knew that Ananda had made that special determination from past life to become the attendant of the Buddha. And he knew that Ananda was the one who was most suitable for the, for the position. Uh, uh, but Ananda did achieve our hardship after the Buddha passed away. Can I, can I have a comment of myself? Yeah. If I were Ananda, I'll keep my sensual desire so that I know what is more comfortable for the Buddha. <laughs> That's my, just, just my two cents. What, uh, Rep, um, Venerable Obakula does not say that <clears throat> there's anything wrong with it. He's saying that he does what he does as somebody else may get enlightenment, you know, doing something else. He yeah. doesn't say is anything wrong with it. Yeah, no, no, he no. He does not. So therefore he's practicing on it. But then at the same time, I think this, uh, this sutta is based on, remember he's explaining his friend how to go about it. 
And he's actually, gonna, he's going to become a monk also. So he's letting them know, listen, if you mingle with women, then it's going to be much harder to develop, you know, non-sensual desire. And it's going to yeah. come up. Come, yeah. Lust is, is going to rise. Yeah. If you go to people's house, then you're going to have a hard time. You know yeah. what I mean? You must go eat. You know what I mean? What they give yeah. you. And so he's explained to him the way to go to let go attachment. Yeah. I think that's what the sutta means, if I'm right or wrong. I mean, I don't know. Okay, I think that's a good way to read it, to see it as a kind of lesson. And yeah. Well, actually, yeah. it is a lesson in non-attachment, but you know what gives a particular slant to this sutta, there are so many other suttas which speak about non-attachment, renunciation, True. but what gives a particular sort of flavor to this sutta is that first, Bakula seems almost to be claiming like these are his special qualities, that he doesn't go out of his way to help others. And then the compilers of the sutta are saying that these are wonderful and marvelous qualities of Venerable Bakula. So it seems to be applauding that kind of extraordinary degree of withdrawal, aloofness, detachment. But maybe he's talking about that we become too pragmatic or too loose about yeah. our practice and yeah. we're losing our practice. Yeah. We should let go of some other ways because, you know, as you said before, some monks have, have, were having sex. So he's actually... Well, actually not... Well, I, I don't know. Not the Buddhist monks early. Uh, well, I meant to say, Buddha, Buddhist, Buddhist monks Buddhist. were too, but Buddhist. then they got kicked out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, some people would agree it is okay. So therefore, we loosely accept something because we feel it's okay for us you yeah. know, to do it. So we're changing it. Yeah. So that's what he was attacking, I guess. I don't know. Maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The Chinese version has a sentence that's missing in the Nikaya. Has what? A sentence. Yeah. At the end of each quality, uh, yeah. Venerable Bakula will say, uh, I did not have the conceit that I'm superior. I didn't have the conceit, the conceit that I am superior. Oh, that that's I'm very good. Superior. Actually, that's a very useful. Yeah. As a politician, I basically saying they have the same skill, charisma skill. That's all. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we have to end for the day. because of the insurance policy. But we start again in, after the monastery reopens in April. So if you're not registered for the course, either you could give your email to me or better go up to the office and give it to the office and then they'll put it on the register and then when the program starts again in April, then you get an announcement with the schedule.